132, 92.1, WROI, WROIFM.com. Streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5, and soon audio and video, RTC Channel 4. Brandon's still in the studio. Hey. How you doing? Good, Brand. How are you? I'm good. All right. You got your own coffee cup yet? I do not. All right. Well, it's about time. Yeah. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, we'll have to make that happen for you. Right. Anyway, nice to have you with us. And, of course, nice to have John Alley with us, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, nice to have you again. Yeah. Let's talk about the trustees meeting. Trust me. Yeah, kind of a short meeting. Okay. Uh, it's kind of that time of year where we're in between a little bit of everything. Um, so we kind of got in more philosophy and in, in what we're seeing in the hospital right now. And there are two major issues that we're addressing. Uh, the first one we had a fairly uh, good discussion on is uh, there's a lack of mental health uh, facilities in, in our area. And we're seeing a fairly large increase in the amount of people coming in that really do need some mental health and, and mental health issues. And how do we deal with those? And we're just not equipped to do that. We don't have the personnel. We don't have the training. So we, you know, we got to try to find a spot to refer these people to or transfer them to. It's getting more and more difficult. And uh, you know, we were kind of saying back a few years ago, if we had one to two people a year that came in with some sort of mental health issue, you know, it was a lot. It's now one to three to four a wow. week because uh, there's just no place for these folks to exactly. go. So you know, we're having to. How do we handle that internally? Uh, they require uh, more manpower, more resources. Because, you know, sometimes they're a harm to themselves and to others. So how do you handle that in our type of environment? So, you know, we're, we're gearing up for that and figuring out, you know, what can we do to make a safe place for those people and also keep the staff safe at the same time. So it's been a challenge trying to figure out what to do with some of those folks that are having, you know, the personal issues, need some mental health help, and it's just not out there for them. So uh, it's kind of our, our new dilemma. You know, we're good at fixing everything else. Our training is not in that <laughs> mental health, so how do we do that? How do we find those resources? Would Woodlawn ever consider adding that to their portfolio of things they do? You know, probably not. It's such a specialized it field, is. that, and it takes quite a bit of resources. Uh, you know, it's almost like having an ICU patient where you have to have one-on-one -on -one staff for that type of person. And the building just wasn't built, wasn't designed for that. Right. Most of the time, it has to be a very secure area, uh, so the folks, you know, don't have the ability to wander off and so we just the infrastructure is not there to do that so uh you know we try to work with four county and bowen center and whatever's around us to find spots and the issue we're having when we call this we have no beds you know they're being you know uh, filled up with folks also so it's kind of a, a unique problem and it's it's a difficult one for the especially for the er and that's that's where they come you know they come to the er or law enforcement will find these folks wandering around they bring them to the er and then we have to figure out what do we do with them so it ties up you know a lot of resources in the er which kind of led us to the our second major discussion is you know in the past 90 days we've had you know more and more complaints of people saying the long wait times in er and uh, you know one of the things i went and looked at is we've had about a 42 percent increase in volumes in the er in the past 90 days which is it's amazing. A, that is a large yes, increase for us. You know, we have nine ER rooms, but we always have to keep one available, one of our trauma rooms, because you never know when you might have that car accident. Or, so we always keep that open just in case. So we've been getting a lot of complaints. People say, well, I was here before them. You know, so the process that we have to go through is when you present to the out front to the registration, you know, they call back and a nurse comes out and basically does an evaluation. You know, what are you here for? And, uh, you know, if you're having chest pains, your shortness of breath, you have a major trauma, you're going to come right back. And, you know, we've had people complain, well, I was here before them. Why do they get to go back? Well, we can't discuss, you know, those particulars with them. And uh, so we've been getting, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of complaints and, uh, you know, Facebook posts, how I had to wait two hours, had to wait three hours. We try to let folks know when they come in, when we've had a 40% increase in volumes, you know, it's going to take time. So we've got to treat the most seriously injured, most seriously ill first. And uh, for whatever reason, we've been having a, a lot of chest pains coming in. And that's a very extensive workup on a patient. So if you would come in and you've got tightness in your chest, for that patient, they're going to tie up a room probably five hours. We run a, a preliminary enzymes on, you know, on their heart and, and what's in their blood wait three and a half hours and repeat that test okay has it you know let up or is it continuing so you know that takes that room out of service for three and a half to four hours and uh one day last week we was down there and we had five chest pains in there all at the same time oh my uh that's very taxing on the staff sure because is. you have to very closely monitor those folks 
you know, check what's going on with them. So, again, the rest of the ER starts backing up. And, you know, folks just don't understand that. And it's hard for us to try to get that message across that, you know, we're, it's not we're not doing anything. We're really busy anymore in the ER. Other contributing factor, uh, PEP used to be the group of physicians that came down. They were from Parkview that manned the ER. Well, they got to the point that they were growing so large within the uh, Parkview group that they could no longer service our, our hospital. So we had to go out and find a new emergency room group. So it takes time to get those new physicians up and familiar with our uh, computer system. Everything's electronic now. It's not like the good old days, red paper <laughs> charts, which to me was easier. Uh, so everything's electronic. So, you know, it takes a while for somebody to get very familiar. So are they a little slower on the input? Yes. Uh, you know, now that we've, they've been here for a while, they started in May. And it takes 60 to 90 days to really get familiar how to, you know, navigate through that system. So we're seeing they're getting quicker. But that with that 40% increase in volumes really put us behind the eight ball and trying to, you know, have uh, we always like to have very quick throughput in our ER. And uh, here lately, there has been some days, especially weekends, Saturday afternoons, Sundays. It's we've been having three and four hour waits for folks to get in just because we've had so many serious either accidents or illnesses or shortness of breath or, or chest pains that have been coming in. It really takes a long time to work those type of patients through the system. Now, I guess you, I hear you saying then you have to almost define what emergency room care is to be. And those cases that need emergency treatment get the emergency treatment. They get it first. Yes. Right. And, you know, it, it, and we're no different than anybody else. If we would truly look at all the volume that runs through the emergency room, 20 to 25 percent would be what we would deem as true emergency you know, the others are things that you could go to a family doctor, but Sunday afternoon, you've got a kid with an earache. You don't want to wait all right. all weekend for that. So we understand those, but we have to have the folks also understand there are people that are in there with far more serious illness or injuries. They are get, get treated first, even though you might have come in before them. And, and it's, you know, it's, I know it's hard to, uh, you're sitting in the waiting room, somebody walks right through the front door in a wheelchair and we take them straight back. You know, I've been here three hours. Why do they get to go back? We can't discuss those, you know, particular right, you cases with right. the folks. But what's usually happened, that's been determined that that patient is far sicker, more injury. Something's going on that has right. bumped them to the head of that list. Right. And uh, we're going to get to you. And we try to keep folks informed, you know, what the weight is. But again, like anything else, when we're treating the patients, it's hard to break away and go out and say, hey, it's going to be another two hours, stuff like that. But we try to, you know, communicate the best we can with, with the folks on that wait time. And we're, you know, what can we do to change it? And it's hard to find that because as soon as we staff up, we don't have the volumes. Right. Then we got people just, you know, standing around doing nothing. So uh, it's a very difficult situation. I mean, it's unfortunate that folks are needing to come into the ER, but I'm, we're glad we're there to help them. But they just need to be patient and understand it's, we're not just sitting there doing nothing. And, uh, you know, sometimes if you come back, we're, they're in that nurse's station, and it looks like, well, they're just sitting around. Well, they're doing all the paperwork, the charting. They're, they're actually monitoring the patients remotely through the computers getting the test order, getting the interpretations to the physician so then they can make their diagnosis and say, okay, yeah, we need to keep this person, we need to ship this person. Um, and we do we ship quite a few people to tertiary care centers because mm -hmm. that's where they need to be. Well, again, that adds to that time factor because now we have to basically copy the whole chart, have that ready for the ambulance crew when they come pick up that patient. So lots involved, lots going on behind the scenes. A lot of folks don't understand. And, uh, you know, the staff, uh, I just... I don't understand sometimes how they get everything done they do uh, they're very good at getting stuff done they 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 get yelled at a lot and uh they try to keep a smile on their face and keep moving but yeah folks just need to understand uh you know we do look at whatever that injury is illness is and we kind of you know put you in the slot so to speak as to where you need to be as far as treatment priorities do you anticipate that volume to continue i think it's going to continue okay um and I'm not sure all of a sudden why we've seen that. Uh, it, it's uh, and a lot of it are in, you know minor injuries, sprained ankles, you know, uh, hurt my wrist, hurt my shoulder. Right. You know, I right. think we're getting that time of year. Everybody's doing more yard work, trying to get stuff done before you know the winter gets in, and so we're seeing more aches and pains like that. But the you know we've been seeing a lot of chest pains, a lot of shortness of breath, and you know is it because of our you know the demographics for our community here we're a little older community mm -hmm. on average than some of the mm -hmm. others because of the retirement community with the lake and everything so i think that has a little bit to do with it that 
you know, as you and I get older, sure. we still think we can do the things we did 20 years John, ago. we can. Um, <laughs> our mind says yes, but our body will That's tell right. us differently. So I think a lot of that's going on. We're, we're, we're starting to see more and more of that. To just, you know, you got to kind of take it easy. And uh, as we get more in our senior years, we can't do what we used to do. Maybe back it down a little bit. And what we used to do in an hour, let's take two hours to do. Right. Uh, or at least an hour and a half. Or at least an hour and a half, yeah. So <laughs> exactly. I, I think that's what we're going to start seeing is, uh, you know, that volume. When it first happened, I thought it was just kind of an unusual spike, but it's been continuing okay. going on now for about the past 90 days, a, a fairly dramatic increase in our volumes. Uh, a lot of out-of-town folks. We're seeing a lot of out-of-county folks coming into the emergency room. So I don't know if they're, you know, going someplace else and to wait there. So, they, you know, they're just, you know, trying to find the spot to get in. But it's, uh, you know, it's kind of nice folks recognize us and are coming here, but uh, it is creating a little bit of a traffic flow problem for us as we try to figure out how to handle those peaks and valleys and make sure everybody gets the adequate care that they deserve. Okay. So once we got through that, then we finally did get into the financials uh, for the month of July. We had gross revenue about $10.1 million. Uh, our deductions was six point one million, uh, so that's you know, right in that sixty percent. We're kind of hanging right in that same right. area, so that give us uh, you know cash in the bank to play with, so to speak, of four point two million. Uh, and we spent four point three, so we had about thirteen thousand dollar loss for the month, which is uh, you know a little more than we anticipated. Uh, we were hoping more for a break even. So August appears uh, we've had uh, f- again volumes really been right. up uh, not only with, through the ER. Even on the inpatient side, uh, we're having probably an average ba- daily bed count of 13, 14, 15 per day, whereas in June, July, we're having three and four. So we're we're seeing much sicker folks are coming in for some, for some odd reason. And, uh, you know, we're here to take care of them and doing the best we can. I find that interesting, though, that usually when you hit the back-to-school season, uh, things kind of diminish a little bit. But obviously, this year, they're picking yeah, up. Yeah, it's kind of reversed. Uh, usually, right. when we go back and look at history, our... You know, we're kind of busy in that May, June, July. It drops off August, September, picks up November. We've kind of flip-flopped this year, so we were kind of see a reversal of that. So um, it's hard to, you know, plan on staffing because staff, we, we look at historic uh, levels, and staff says, okay, we've always been slow in, you know, this mm-hmm. time of year, August, September. That's when I want to take my vacation. So now not only do we have an increase in volume, we've got staff that's you know, had vacation scheduled mm-hmm. for six months. I, it's not fair for me because hey, you got to cancel your vacation. Uh, so you know we have to work around those things too. So it's just kind of caught us a little off guard this year with that flip flop in our volumes and when our peak is at. And uh, of course the ER, the you know dramatic increase in volumes right. there that really right. hit us off guard. And, and uh, you know we're monitoring that and are, are we going to have to make changes in how we staff down there if this continues? We're going to have to look at this and find out what is going to be the best model to to meet everybody's needs. Exactly. Okay. And that was pretty well the board meeting. That pretty well took care of it. That took care of it. All us. right. Any, uh, I know that uh, we were talking before we went on the air that the uh, commissioners will submit a name, I guess, for the board coming up next month. Yes, they're going to make their, uh, we've submitted some names to them uh, from our recommendations, which they can either accept those, pick somebody else, or ask us to come up with some more names. But uh, they did indicate that at their next meeting, which I believe we talked about September 5th, right. uh, that they will make their announcement who they're going to appoint to the hospital board um, You know, with Randall uh, finally retiring and okay. going to hang it up a little okay. bit. Uh, we were kind of reminiscing a little bit yesterday. He said he's going to miss it, and we all said, we're going to miss Randall. <laughs> you know, he's been a, a, a pretty much of a fixture within sure. the board. Ever since I've been at the hospital, he was on the board when I started. So, you know, we, we've kind of, I've grown up with Randall, uh, and uh, it's been kind of fun. We've had a good time. Still waiting to see what comes out of Washington, D.C.? Absolutely. That, uh, just when you kind of think <laughs> you know what's going to happen, you know, something changes. So, I it's, uh, right now, I've kind of not even started watching it. I'm going to kind of wait, maybe they get closer to a final product at that point, then say, how's that going to affect us, and what do we need to do? Uh, you know, one of the projects that we were had kind of a, we've been setting on uh, was changing our computer system there was a requirement it's called meaningful use three that our current software would not do so our software vendor says well you know you're gonna have to buy this new product oh and by the way you gotta buy new servers to go with it so it's gonna be about a four or five hundred thousand dollar cost that we're gonna incur so i was setting on that when they said we're gonna repeal some of those well then all of a sudden that said nope we're not repealing it. So we started scrambling, putting it back together. And I was going to present it to the board yesterday, get an email that, well, now CMS says, no, we're not going to do it now until 2019. 
so it gives us another year wow. so it gives us a little bit of time we'll put it in the budget but that's the things we're, we're kind of fighting is we just don't know you know i'm glad we didn't spend six eight months ago and not need it so uh kind of watching that what are the changes going to be what's it, how are we going to have to react to it how's it going to change some of our requirements that we have to do from reporting to the uh, cms and the other government agencies budget time budget time yeah the the, the staff just loves this time of year <laughs> uh, you know basically we've kind of helped them out a little bit where the finance folks are kind of doing 100 percent of the budget then we're going to sit down with the saying okay here's what we've come up with tell us why this won't work and then if they can't come up with a good reason their budget is done for them for next year so uh trying to tighten it down just a little bit uh we continually want to cut our costs as a cost-based reimbursement from medicare that's a program that could go away at any time so our philosophy has been let's try to keep our cost as low as we can because then if that program goes away it's not going to affect us you know like it will some other facilities who are trying to generate more and more costs to increase their medicare reimbursement uh, so if that program goes away, then all of a sudden they're kind of got the high cost structure. They need to immediately make some cuts. We're kind of already there. So, um, you know, if that cost-based reimbursement would go away for the Medicare program, f- fairly comfortable. It's not going to be a big effect on us because we've kind of already got to that point where we're about as bare bones as we can get from our cost perspective. After you finish the budget, where does it go from there? At that point, then it's presented to the board okay. uh, for them to, to review and either approve or disapprove. And then uh, once the board approves that, then we have to go into the computer system and load the budget into the, you know, the financial package. So then it can start comparing actual to budget as we get into uh, 2018. Okay. Do you have to submit it to the state, perhaps, or? We kind of do and we kind of don't. Okay. Uh, you know, CMS wants a, what's called a, uh, CMS is basically Medicare. They want a three-year capital budget. So they want to know what are our anticipation that we're going to do from capital improvements for the next three years. So we prepare that. And so we kind of give them the other budget with it, but they're more interested. What are you going to spend on infrastructure improvements over the next three years? And it's not that we have to do it, but they say, we want to know what that you're thinking about it, that you're planning for that future so that all of a sudden your facility doesn't get behind the eight ball and trying to make massive changes all at once. So they want to make sure that we are looking for replacement of key uh, components, building maintenance, building infrastructure, and make sure that we're maintaining the facility and not letting it go down, you know, kind of get behind the eight ball and all of a sudden we're stuck with some unexpected expenses. As we wrap this up this morning, I'm curious about something that I see on your sign, which talks about Woodlawn Hospital being one of the safest hospitals in the state of Indiana. I don't know how much you can elaborate on that, but I'm curious about it. Yeah, that came, that was, uh, we submit tons of data to everybody. Right. and it's all quality data. So we, we submit all this data that goes in. And uh, based on, you know, our treatment of our patients, uh, we were deemed to be the second safest hospital in the state of Indiana because of fewer returns for the same illness, uh, fewer deaths in the hospital. So there's a multitude of, of factors that go into that. But that just says we're doing what we should do. Okay. That, uh, you know, we're doing the right things, that we're not having readmissions for the same illness. Uh, we're not having a sepsis, which is a very serious infection. A lot of hospitals have a lot of patients with sepsis, and that's very, you get it, it's pretty serious. We have a very low occurrence of that, very low readmissions, uh, very low post-surgical site infections. So, you know, that all goes into that ranking that they come up with to say, okay, Woodlawn, you know, you're a safe hospital that, you know, you're probably not going to have hospital-acquired symptoms or disease if you go to Woodlawn. Okay. John, September meeting? September meeting, uh, that will be the Randall's final meeting. Okay. Uh, and at that point, you know, uh, we'll know who the new board member is going to be from the commissioners. Um, probably just a preliminary budget overview with them, kind of where are we at at that point. We'll submit probably the final budget in October for them to review and approve in November. Excellent. So uh, not anticipating any major uh, big things coming out of the meeting unless something breaks. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're hoping that doesn't happen. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Keep up the good work. Keep up the good things you do for Fulton County and the entire surrounding area. Well, it's uh, like I've said before, I've got a wonderful staff. They make my job really easy. Uh, you know, they truly care about the community and the people, and it shows in their work. John Alley, thanks. Thank you.